you're with us this morning. Thank you for coming to join us to worship the Lord this morning. I don't know if you noticed the timer or not, but I'm pushing fall just a little bit. Maybe it'll show up. I understand maybe summer will be back next week, though, I'm afraid. I have an, uh, a couple of announcements that I want to make you aware of. First of all, there's a thank you from one of the teachers up at uh, uh, Kansas uh, schools up there from Flint Ridge Chapel. Thank you so much for the awesome breakfast you provided for us uh, take, uh, taking to Kansas, at, teaching at Kansas, that's it. Uh, let's see. Thank you also for the prayers and support as we begin our new school year. We appreciate you all. That's from Beth William, uh, FCS teacher uh, up there at Little Kansas. That was a great breakfast, by the way. Thank you all that had everything to do with that. Uh, I want to make mention of next week, there's a special speaker during Sunday school. Chloe Davenport from CIY will give us an update on one of our missions, Christ in Youth. Make sure you're here for that. She'll have a short update during the worship time as well, but she's uh, given the Sunday school time for next week. Also, it is not Potluck Sunday. Don't bring your food next week. <laughs> bring it the following week. Potluck Sunday this time is going to be the 10th uh, this month because of Labor Day weekend, I guess. That's primarily it. Midweek services start September 6th. Men's meeting uh, September 9th. We need a cook. If you're anxious to cook for that uh, morning breakfast, uh, come and do that for us. If not, we'll just have Bible study, I guess. <laughs> it won't be breakfast and Bible study, just Bible study. No, we'll find somebody. We'll work it out. Women's Bible study going to start up again as well. They're going to be doing the Fruit of the Spirit starting September 16th. Put that on your calendars, ladies, uh, and be here for the Women's Bible study. It seemed like I had one more thing, but I don't see it right offhand. Oh, the information in your bulletin. I'm doing some teasers on Jim's Bible classes. This gives you some information about the new series of Bible studies we'll be starting in October. Next week, we'll actually have a list of where we're going to come into that seven-year study. It'll be in the Gospels, and it'll show you more about what's actually being done. Besides that, because these lessons have been done since, what, 2002 or something? Or 20, when did you start doing the lessons? Four years ago, so there's some previous past lessons, and you'll have a list of those that you can take a look at if you're something you really want to study. Uh, Jim has said he's willing to send you copies of that lesson, even though it's been several years ago that the lesson was written, because it'll be several years until it comes around again. <laughs> anyway, teaser, take a look at that. If you have questions, ask Jim. He's got all the answers. I might have a few, but he's, <laughs> he's got the answers on that. All right, I think that's all the announcements I have. Would you stand with me, please, if you can? for the call to worship from Psalm 145, 1 to 3. I think we've used this before. I try to make these fit with the song that we're singing, and so sometimes they come up again, but it's always good to praise the Lord. So let's do it as our call to worship this morning. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Let's sing together this morning. Majesty, worship His majesty. Majesty, worship His majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, Kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem raised. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus, magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Yeah. 
prepare for communion this morning. I want to make sure that you have your emblems. They're back there in the back as well as back in the fellowship hall so that you might participate during the meditation this morning. Wonderful, merciful Savior. This morning I want to have us look at a couple things that we want to remember this morning during this time. I'll start in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23. It says, For I have received of the Lord which I passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat and drink the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. A very familiar passage of scripture, probably for most of us. Isaiah, the first chapter, verse 18, says, Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins were like scarlet, they shall be, like, they shall be white as snow. And then uh, I'm going to use the chorus of a couple old hymns. I know they're old because we sang them whenever I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> It says, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. 
Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And the second thing I want to look at this morning actually goes along with all the other teaching today, and that is the victory we have in the resurrection of Christ. Matthew 28, 6 says, The angel said to the women, He is not here. He has risen just as he said. And the old song this time is Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He, knew, he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory between the, beneath the cleansing flood. And 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, Thanks be to God, he gave us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning as we partake of these emblems, those are the two things I would like for us to remember. So as we get ready to take those emblems, let's take the, the bread. And then we take the juice. And let's pray. Father, we are very thankful and very grateful for the love that you and your son Jesus have shown for us. The fact that you took us from a situation which was bad and brought us into a situation, now uh, for those of us who have accepted Christ as our Savior, you've got us to a point where we have the hope of eternal life, a life that we can spend with you for eternity. And Father, we just thank you and love you, and we thank you for the love of Jesus that made it possible. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. This next song is one that Mary Ellen Wilkinson says is one of her favorites. So Mary Ellen, if you're listening, <laughs> this is for you and the Lord. God leads us along. Thank you. 
Well, it seems rather strange to be preaching a sermon today about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. It's a sermon that would be a good message for Easter Sunday, but it's today we're tying it in with our lessons in, that we're using in Sunday school, and chapter 27 deals with the resurrection of Jesus. And yet, from the Bible, we learn that the result, resurrection of Jesus was the principal message of the apostles. They proclaimed that Jesus, oh, thank you. <laughs> now am I, kept my voice carrying, thank you very much. It would have dawned on me sooner or later, or Ken would have waved a sign at me. But uh, anyway, the early Christians, the apostles, proclaimed that Jesus rose from the dead, proving that he was the Messiah and that he had the authority to promise them that we too we could rise and be with him for all eternity, and that his teachings are from God. And that is a message worth repeating over and over again. Now, we live in a time when we battle against a flood of, of circumstances that seem to threaten our very survival and leave us overwhelmed by a flood of despair, guilt, regret, and loneliness. Without the resurrection, without it, at its worst, we have a dead man hanging on a cross. But at its best, We have a human system of what we think is right and what is wrong if there was no resurrection. But with the resurrection of Jesus, new life is breathed into the shattered dreams. With the resurrection, Christianity is an opportunity to experience new life and new living, both for now and in the future. It lifts us above the level of mere survival to a life that is fulfilled and meaningful, living with a purpose. The resurrection is the crucial event in Christian history because of the incredible difference it makes in the lives of Christ's followers. But what is it about the resurrection that makes it so important to us that Christianity ultimately rises or falls, whether it's true or false? The answer can partly be seen in the record of those who were witnesses of the resurrection. This morning, we're going to look at 17 verses that end the Gospel of Luke. And I'm going to be using the New International Reader's Version of the Bible. Now, I like it because they advertise that it's set for a third grade mind. <laughs> it makes it simple for me to understand and read. Now, the NIV that I usually use, they say, was designed for a 11-year-old uh, or, 
or for an eighth grade mind. But the third grade mind works for me. <laughs> and from those verses, those 17 verses at the end of the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, we will see how the resurrection has power to lift us out of despair to a life lived to its full. Now let me set the stage for you. Beginning with Luke, the 24th chapter, the 13th verse, the story is told of two of Jesus' disciples who are going home from Jerusalem. This is a day that we normally, or we call Easter, our Resurrection Sunday, the very first one. And in their own words, in verses 20 and 21, they describe to a stranger they have just met on the road their shattered dreams, talking about Jesus, they said. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. They nailed him to a tree. But we had hoped. Do you hear their despair? We had hoped. But now we're going back home. What a startling revelation was waiting for them because the one with whom they shared their shattered dreams was soon to breathe life back into their dreams. The Jesus whom they have given up for dead was alive and walking and talking with them, although they didn't realize it yet. Now, after telling the stranger that they had met some of the strange news they had heard during the day from some women and from some of their friends, the stranger said to them, How foolish you are. How long it takes for you to believe all that the prophets said. Didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things? And Jesus explained to them what was said about himself in all the scripture and all the prophets. They approached the village where they were going. And Jesus kept walking as if he were going farther. But they tried hard to keep him from leaving. They said, stay with us. It is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. He joined them at the table. Then he took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and began to give it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But then he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, He explained to us what the scriptures meant. Weren't we excited as he talked with us on the road? I guess you'd be excited right then, too for a person to be sitting in front of you and you suddenly recognize him as Jesus and suddenly he disappears from their sight. Well, what do you suppose they do? Well, now that they had seen Jesus alive, they rush back to Jerusalem, seven miles, to tell the other disciples, this is where we pick it up again in Verse 35 of Luke, the 24th chapter. 
they rush into the room where the rest of the apostles, or most of them, and the women are in hiding. And it says, then the two of them told what had happened to them on the way. They told how they had recognized Jesus when he broke the bread. The disciples were still talking about this when Jesus himself suddenly stood among them. Didn't say he opened the door and came in. He suddenly stood among them. Well, if he could disappear, he could appear. He said, may you have peace. They were surprised and terrified. They thought they were seeing a ghost. Well, wouldn't you if he came in through a door that wasn't open? But anyway, they came in. They were, thought they were seeing a ghost. Now, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, Victor Frankl, now you'll need to know, remember that name. He was the successor of Sigmund Freud, whose name I'm sure many of you have heard. But he argued that the loss of hope and courage can have a deadly effect on man. Now, he was a prisoner of the Nazis during World War II. And from his own experience in a Nazi concentration camp, he says that when a man had no longer possesses a motive for living, no future to look forward to, he curls up in a corner and dies. Well, most of us have had shattered dreams, haven't we? That could have caused a feeling of hopelessness. It might have been the loss of a loved one. Or of a close <coughs> relationship that was broken. The loss of a job. Or perhaps a sin we have committed that we just can't believe God would forgive. Whatever the case, most of us have felt those moments in our life, well, when we feel sort of hopeless. Now that's how these disciples felt. But the resurrected Jesus reached across the brokenness to restore their hopes and joy. Jesus said to them in this room, Why are you troubled? Why do you have doubts in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It's really me. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have a body or bones, but you can see that I do. After he said that, he showed them his hands and feet. Now, Stephen Chapman, a preacher in Chicago, wrote these words, and I want to read them to you. When we arrived in Chicago nearly 18 years ago, I had a lot to learn about the urban environment and urban ministry. My friend, Pastor Ernie, was the black preacher who allowed me to ask all my stupid white man questions. One question I had was, why in some neighborhoods, African Americans let their property go unmaintained? Why don't they take care of their homes? And his answer was short and simple. They don't believe things are ever, will ever get any better. So they don't see any reason to keep them up. They have lost 
hope. Are you aware that studies have shown that when the gospel impacts a neighborhood, it actually becomes cleaner and better? Hope has been restored. There's now a reason to live. It's something you can see on the mission field, in a village where they worship demons and idols of all sorts. You'll see all kinds of filth, superstition, but in a village where Christ has come, oh, what a difference in appearance. It is this hope, this joy, that changes those fearful disciples into a determined group that turn the world upside down. Or maybe we ought to say right side up. And when hope is restored, other transformations follow. Verses 41, 42 say, but they still did not believe it. They were amazed and filled with joy. So Jesus asked them, do you have anything here to eat? Now, there's a reason he asked that, because they believed in ghosts, and ghosts can't eat. So they gave him a piece of cooked fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. Now, how could these two sentences that I've just read both be true? Let me read them again. But they still did not believe it. They were amazed and filled with joy. If they didn't believe it, why would they be filled with joy? Well, the idea that Luke is trying to present is not that they didn't believe it, but that they were feeling it's too good to be true. An overwhelming sense of joy that completely caught them off guard. So Jesus lets them know it's really true. And their joy is still there 50 days later after seeing him ascend into heaven. In verse 52, it says, with great joy they returned to Jerusalem. So hope and joy is a result of knowing that Jesus is alive. And now if we will experience the resurrection, a new spirit of joy and amazement at life, will be breathed back into us. Peter Tellihard, who's, well, let me give you his whole name. And I hope I pronounce it correctly because it's French. Pierre Tellihard de Chardin, who's considered a brilliant Christian thinker of our present time, said, Joy is the sweet, surest sign of the presence of God. There's something inside of us when God is there, when we know he's alive. There's a joy that the rest of the world doesn't have. Well, so the bottom line for you and for me is simply this. There are not to be any Sad sack saints. If God really is the center of our lives, if Christ really did conquer the grave and death, joy is inevitable. If we have no joy, we have missed the heart of the good news, the gospel. But don't get me wrong. People who consistently laugh do so in spite of, seldom because of, their circumstances. 
In other words, things aren't always happy. But they pursue joy. They pursue it rather than wait for it to knock on their door in the midst of life. Now, such infectiously joyful believers have no trouble convincing people around them that Christianity is real and that Christ can transform a life. One of the greatest examples of this was a preacher that I knew and that almost everybody in the state of Kentucky do by the name of Wayne Smith. He preached for a church that grew and grew, and he was known for his joy. He was known for his jokes. He was known for how he touched the heart of people. And time after time, government officials would ask him to speak for various meetings of government officials. Joy is the flag that flies above the castle of our hearts announcing that the king is risen. Now verses 44 and 40 through 49 says, Jesus said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must come true. You know, I would have loved to have been on that road to Emmaus and have Jesus himself talking to me as he talked to those two who were traveling and telling them, explaining to him what all the prophecies, what all the scriptures in what we call the Old Testament meant that concerned him. And then it says, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer. He will rise from the dead on the third day. His followers will preach in his name. They will tell others to turn away from their sins and be forgiven. People from every nation will hear it beginning at Jerusalem. You have seen these things with your own eyes. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. And that was the Holy Spirit. But for now, stay in the city there until you have received power from heaven. Now, don't miss this. This house full of hopeless and frightened disciples holed up in what we would call their hideout soon became a tremendous force with the power of the Holy Spirit to start a transformation of the world in their day, a transforming movement that lasts to this very day. You see, the resurrection is not an event just for us to celebrate as Christians. It is an event to be shared with millions who are still suffering in hopeless and joyous lives. And I can't help but say those words without remembering the scenes that I, as a child, remember from the streets of Adenza in western China on the Tibetan border. Yes, I know that it's our responsibility and it rests squarely on our shoulders. That responsibility 
is ours as a congregation. Every last one of us to recognize our responsibility of reaching out to those who are lost. And we will never be what we should be until we do. Now, I know that there are many who are giving sacrificially in this congregation to win the lost or serve those who need our help. But consider these questions. Are you going out of your way to offer to others a taste of the hope and joy that comes from Christ? Are you giving the Holy Spirit every opportunity to use you to touch another soul with the life-giving power of the resurrection of Jesus? The resurrection restores our hope and joy. It renews our mission. Now, finally... We read, Jesus led his disciples out to an area near Bethany. Then he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them. He was taken up into heaven. Now we have that same thing repeated in more detail in the beginning of the book of Acts. But we go on to read from Luke. Then they worshipped him. With great joy they returned to Jerusalem. Every day they went to the temple praising God. I mean, here's joy in the resurrection. And it's finding its outlet in their worship. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose. He arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. I love how the new living translation phrases this last sentence that we read from the scripture. They spent all their time in the temple praising God. And that's the core thought of that verse. Worship becomes a heart and soul of our lives. Worship that springs from celebrating the risen Jesus cannot be restricted by our 20th and 21st century obsession with time. It should be the focus of our lives. After preaching my sermon last week about heaven, I came across these words. Worship is going to be the primary activity of heaven. And if we don't have time for it while we are alive, why in the world would we want to go to heaven? I think it's a good question. Can I get personal now for a minute? And I'm pointing my finger at me on this. Worship doesn't set limits on how long we worship because no amount of time is ever enough for us to declare our love for God. And again, I point finger at myself. 
Worship does not upset, okay. Worship is not restricted to a definite number of songs because no number of songs is sufficient for us to express our love and appreciation to God. And again, worship does not obsess about the length of the sermon. Now I'm pointing the finger at you. (laughs) Because worship is preoccupied with wonder over the word of God. What is the limit on your worship? What is the chance that God would say to you, leaving so early, so soon? I was hoping that you would stay around for a little while longer. The resurrection is more than how we entered worship today. The resurrection is an event that reaches out to us and our hearts that have been sucked dry by the despair of our times. We are restored, refreshed, renewed, revived by an overwhelming hope, a joy and a sense of mission and consistent worship. So my question is, are you surviving the challenges of life? Are you getting along or just getting by? The message of the resurrection is that God offers us victory over the toughest of life's challenges. Oh, we're going to sing an invitation hymn. And may I remind you that the gospel consists of proclaiming the fact that we're sinners. We're sinners, every one of us. We've known what's wrong, right and what's wrong, whether we've learned it from the Bible or from our own conscience. We know what we've done that's wrong. Secondly, if we're sinners... We know that our only hope is Jesus Christ who died upon the cross so that we might be forgiven. And we know that he is giving us an opportunity to repent of our sins. And you know that the word repent means to turn around and go not our own direction, our own way, but go God's way. And you know that if we've made up our mind to do that, that we're going to make it clear by being willing to let the world know, or at least those around us know, that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we're willing to follow him and his command in baptism. And we rise in a new life, a new relationship with God, forgiven of our past with a joy and a hope that will go on for all eternity. If you haven't done that, oh, I pray that you will. So it's Christianity, our, our faith, is not a long, drawn faith thing. It's a joyful thing because Jesus arose. If you've already done all that and need a place to worship, we invite you to come here and make this a place of service. It's your decision. Will you come as we sing together?
I realize that there may at times be those in the congregation who have questions they want to ask before they make important decisions. And this is the most important decision of all. Let me know. I'll be more than happy to spend some time with you. We'll turn to God's word, see what it says, because this is too valuable to pass up. Thank you. We're going to have a time of prayer now. This concludes today's worship service. Thank you for listening. We hope you were encouraged by joining us on Facebook Live. Please message us if you have questions or would like more information. May God bless you and give you his peace.